Okay. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jim Jasinski. I'm with OSU Extension, the IPM program. I'm one of the co-sponsors, co-presenters of today's uh, Master Gardener review of the Spotowing Drosophila trapping protocol. Um, with me in Columbus is Celeste. Celeste, want to introduce yourself? Okay, hi, I'm Celeste Welty. I'm um, an extension entomologist working with uh, vegetables, tree fruit, and small fruit. Um, right. based on main campus. Yeah, great. So between the two of us, we're going to trade off and on uh, for about a 20 slide PowerPoint to, you know, hopefully reinforce what you saw um, in the videos. You know, what we normally do is have kind of a much more elaborate um, program for people that trap for us, but we're just really trying to get folks to um, collect samples for us so that we can then uh, go through those samples do the identification, which is kind of the heavy lifting part of this whole project, take that off of your shoulders, and then see if those counties are in fact positive. So uh, some of this stuff um, you know, is, is more detailed, but we're not gonna really go into that. It's not really necessary, but if you have questions, we'll be glad to, to answer those. Um, so um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put you on mute so that you don't interrupt the presentation, but at the very end, we're gonna have a chance for questions and answers, and so then I'll unmute your mic so we can just kind of have a conversation at that point, okay? All right, so we're gonna go ahead and share the screen and get started. Okay, so this is the uh, initial slide. It's just Celeste and I talking about the Spotted Wing Drosophila project. And so at the end of the webinar, what we're hoping is that uh, you're going to be able to understand why spotted wing is a serious pest of small fruit. You're going to understand the distribution of this uh, pest through uh, the country and through Ohio. You're going to know how to set the trap up in the field, you know, uh, how to collect specimens out of the trap. Uh, we're going to tell you how to take those uh, vials of insects that you've collected and ship those off to Columbus to Celeste for identification. And then if you have any questions along the way, we're going to show you, you know, where to look uh, for some additional resources. And so at this point in time, I'm going to hand it over uh, to Celeste. So Celeste, you want to go ahead and, and uh, just give me a signal when you want me to advance the slide. Please just stay on that slide for now. Okay, so this is just an overview of um, the disgusting mess that spotted wing drosophila makes of so many of our fruit crops. Um, you'll see these are six different crops, but it's all the same basic thing of just turning the fruit to mush in pretty short order um, just before harvest. And then if you can see some like in the raspberry, you see that little white thing there. That is the actual larva, the spotted wing. And we have found sometimes even in a single raspberry, you know, multiple like six or even ten uh, small larvae in each of those. Um, so this all happens quite quickly and then the fruit deteriorates and then you get of course different secondary problems like molds uh, coming in. So we are mainly seeing it on raspberry and blueberry. Strawberry as we were chatting about a few minutes ago, the, the traditional June bearing strawberries usually escape. It's only the ever bearing strawberries that really have a problem and then uh, also some high tunnels. Some people are growing strawberries late in the season in high tunnels and they are having a problem. Grapes, it is a problem, but only much later than the other crops. Cherries, um, of course we have very few cherries in Ohio, um, but they often escape because they're just a little too early. Spotted wing doesn't really get going um, much in the May and into June. And then peaches is another one. It's more of a late, uh, a late problem, but they can get in peaches. So Jim, next slide. And the main reason that they cause such tremendous problems is they have this really short life cycle. So as it's diagrammed here, it's only eight to 16 days to complete an entire generation. So just briefly, the way it goes, you have the adult up here at the top. Uh, she lives for 20 to 30 days. The female lays eggs uh, on the surface of the fruit. Oh. That's me. Okay, so you're not seeing my cursor? No. Ah, okay. Um, then uh, these eggs hatch, so here a critical thing is that 12 to 72 hours, the eggs hatch really quickly. Um, and then they go through three larval instars. You, we usually don't see the first because they're so small, but you can start to see the seconds and thirds. It takes about five to seven days total to go through those three instars. 
Then they enter their pupil stage that might be inside or outside the fruit. They stay as larvae, as a pupae for four to 15 days than the new adults. But the key thing there is just how short that generation is. Um, and also in terms of when the damage is inflicted, it is, it is when this adult is laying the eggs, that is the damage. She pierce, she either lays them on the surface or just under the surface of the fruit. And then those larvae are inside the fruit causing it to rot. Okay, Jim. In terms of distribution, um, if you look down near the bottom, we knew it was in Hawaii um, back in the 19, in 1980 and not on the mainland until August of 2008 when it arrived in California. Then over there in Ohio, you see we had our first detection in 2011. All of the red, uh, this map was done in 2016. So it showed that after uh, a very quick invasion in 2009 to the West Coast and parts of the East Coast, it spread over the entire country in very short order. Next slide. <clears throat> what Jim and I have been working on since 2012, since that initial discovery is where is it in Ohio? And uh, what this map shows is the county shaded in red is where it has been confirmed. Yellow, it's suspected. Gray are the few counties where uh, someone has looked and not found it. And the white counties are where we have not had surveys or confirmed reports. So that is where you guys fit in. That this year we were making an effort to try and fill in some of those gaps to see whether it is or is not present. So we're really grateful that you guys have volunteered to help us with this. Okay, then okay. back to Jim. <clears throat> yeah, thanks Celeste. That was a good grounding in sort of where it's been on the national level and uh, where it's been on the local level. Uh, this um, picture here is just to, to sort of remind you that these guys over here on the left hand side, this is the male spotted wing drosophila. It's got the spots on its wings, that's where the spot it comes from. Um, and then the females over here on the right doesn't have, does not have the spots, but has this really big ovipositor. So the tough part of this whole monitoring job is to figure out the males and the females. Now, in this screen, it looks pretty obvious because uh, you know they're a couple inches in size, but in real life, they're only a few millimeters in size. And so we need to use stereoscopes to, um, to look down on some of the features to confirm if we have this or not. And that's really the hard part about this that we're not going to ask you to do. Uh, we're just gonna ask you to collect the specimens and then send them, send them to us. So the third image over here is the trap we're currently going to be using for our monitoring. It's a sentry uh, spotted wing drosophila trap. There are lots of trap designs, but over the years, Celeste and I think that this one works pretty well. And so we're gonna use it for this particular one. And uh, what's interesting is on the inside of it is this little bag over here on the right-hand side. This is the actual lure that attracts the spotted wing into the trap. And so these are the things that you'll be getting in your little goodie bag that Celeste will mail to you. You'll be getting two traps and you'll be getting two lures and that'll be good uh, for that four week period that we're asking you to monitor. Hey Jim, do you want to comment on what that lure smells like? Yeah, so the, yeah, so as, as is going to be revealed in this slide here, um, the, the lure itself is, is not a toxicant. There's, there's nothing about it. You can touch it, you know, uh, it's fine. If you do happen to smell it, it's going to smell like salt and vinegar potato chips. Um, has a really kind of interesting odor to it, but again, it's not poisonous, it's not toxic. So if you want to take a whiff of it just out of curiosity, you can go ahead and do that. Um, and like I mentioned before, the lure that's, uh, that we see over here on the right um, is actually attached to the lid, which then you know is screwed onto the jar. So in this image, you see um, the jar, the lure is inside of it. That's where the top arrow is pointing. Um, the bottom arrow is pointing to what we call the drowning solution. Now the drowning solution is actually how we catch the spot of wings. So um, if you look at the left side of this trap, you see this little black um, fixture with some tiny holes in it. That's the only way that the spot of wing get into the trap. They smell the lure, they go through the holes, they sort of buzz around the inside of the trap. They get tired or want to sit down. They might land in that um, drowning solution. They get captured and they actually do die that way. So all of the insects that we're gonna be collecting are gonna be caught down here in this bottom one inch of fluid 
uh, the starting solution that's that's in this jar. Um, it's a it's a pretty simple mixture. We're just going to have you use um, uh, fifty percent apple cider vinegar mixed with water. So basically, one cup apple cider vinegar to one cup water. That's the ratio we're looking for. And a tiny drop of this uh, soap that Celeste will give you to sort of break the water tension, so that uh, when the insects land on the water, they actually kind of get drawn in and, and captured by that. And that's and that's it. It's a pretty simple uh, mechanism. Um, now, one thing I do want to mention to you and reinforce that all we're doing is putting about one inch of that drowning solution in the bottom of um, this trap. We're not filling the trap up with the solution. So that's the only thing you want to sort of keep in mind. Um, I know you've looked at the videos or should have looked at the videos by now. And the idea of sort of how to place the traps um, in the field is important. You know, it will affect, you know, what we capture and how soon we capture. So um, really the, the rule for us is we're looking at basically two traps per site or field. And since you're only going to be monitoring one field, you only need two traps. We want to put one trap at the edge of the field and then put one trap, you know, a little bit more to the interior and middle of the field. Um, if there happens to be a woods near that property, uh, we know that the spotted wing drosophila like to overwinter in the wooded areas and come from those areas into the field. So we want to put that trap really between the woods and that particular um, crop. The last thing I'll mention is spotted wing will go to the crop that's fruiting first and then sort of move on to crops that fruit secondly. So um, when you when you go to put those up at the farm, you want to make sure you, you talk with the farmer and say, you know, what is the first thing that's going to flower and fruit on your farm uh, that's susceptible to spotted wing? And that's where you want to put the traps. Like Celeste mentioned, if you have a choice between strawberries and blackberries, you know, I would say choose the blackberries because they will be more attractive. So in this example of this diversified farm here, raspberries is the earliest ripening fruit. So if this was the farm you were going to be uh, actually monitoring, given where the woods is located, you know, you'd want to put one of those traps toward the edge of that field, close to the woods, and then one more toward the interior, okay? And then if you're kind of curious about the blueberry field, again, there's one toward the edge and one toward the interior. And grapes would be the last example, one toward the edge nearest the woods, and then one more towards the interior. So where exactly these traps go is completely up to you and convenience for you. In this example here, let's just suppose there's a, um, assuming you can see my cursor, there's a road that, let's just say it's a road that kind of runs along the top of this image, along the top of this raspberry field. You could easily put the trap up in this corner here and then back in the center here. So make it easier for yourself when you put these traps out, uh, easier for you and out of the way of the, of the grower. Uh, they always appreciate not running stuff over. So um, that's really the, the rules of the trap deployment that I think you want to, uh, th that you need to go ahead and carry this project forward. So if we look at a real picture of a, of a farm that we monitor, um, and then we think about where we might want to put the traps, you can see there's sort of woods along this left edge and along this bottom edge here. The blue or purple rectangle, those are actually blueberries. The black rectangle is blackberries, and the red one is uh, red raspberries. So depending upon which of these crops were to flower and fruit first, you know, I might think about putting a trap down here at this lower edge and maybe somewhere in the middle. You could also put one on this left edge over here and toward the middle. Those would be fine. If we're thinking about the blackberries, um, you know, again, somewhere at this bottom edge would be fine, or this edge over here would be fine, and somewhere in the middle with the red raspberries, again, maybe something at this edge here and something more toward the middle. So just use, you know, uh, your, your best guess as to where to put those traps. The important thing is one on the edge and one about, you know, 50 or 80 feet to the inside of that one. In terms of where to actually place the traps in the canopy, this is something that's really important because you have to realize this trap is competing with the flowers and the fruit that are out in the field. And so it really has to be at a site where the spotted wing are going to be attracted, which is the flowers and the fruit. Um, if you have a crop like raspberries um, that uh, 
maybe they are not trellised, they don't have any structure supporting them. Uh, if you go to put this trap onto one of the uh, bramble um, branches, it might be a little heavy, heavy it might weigh it over, uh, you know, sort of do the best you can do. Um, I sometimes use these little shepherd's hooks, uh, crooks, which we are not going to be supplying to you, but I mean, sometimes it, it does work to have something like that. Uh, but if you don't have one, that's fine. Just do the best you can do. If you have a crop over here like grapes or sometimes uh, blackberries are trellis like this, you can actually just clip the trap right on to one of the trellis uh, lines here and you should be fine. Okay, so uh, the point is uh, just try to do the best you can do in, in terms of trap placement in the canopy, um, you know, uh, so that it's near some flowers or, or some fruit and that's really about the best you're going to be able to do. Now uh, we're gonna show you actually, I know you saw the video, but we're gonna actually kind of run through this, how to get the contents you know, from this trap that's been out in the field for a week over into these vials, and that's what you'll be shipping to us. We're gonna go through that uh, sort of a live demonstration to make sure you see that, and, and you know, hopefully uh, if, if you have any questions, you can ask us at that point in time. Um, but you can always refer to the video or ask us uh, particular questions if, if you want. Uh, I just wanna remind you that there are a lot of things that can be attracted to these traps. And even though we are just really trying to look for spot spotting Drosophila, there can be lots of other um, Drosophila type or vinegar type flies in there. There could be beetles, spiders, moths, wasps. I mean, just all kinds of stuff. So the bottom line is just because there's something in the trap does not mean it's a spot spotting Drosophila. So uh, let us do the identification part and we'll let you know if we find it or not. But uh, there could be a mixed bag in terms of, of what's in that trap. Uh, I just wanted to reinforce, you know, the dates that are important to us, and that is the week of June 17 through 21, if you could put those traps out at the site. Uh, and then that first week of June 24 to 28 is when you'll go ahead and change out uh, the drowning solution at the bottom of the trap, and that's when you'll collect the specimens, do the same thing in the following week, um, one through five of July. You'll take those four vials that you have, with the shipping container that Celeste gives you and you'll ship those off to Columbus. And then you'll repeat that for the next two weeks, July 8 through 12, you'll make that third trap change, uh, July 15 through 19 be the last one. You can go ahead and package up those four vials and send those off to Columbus. One thing that's kind of nice for us and it would probably be nice for you too, to just make sure that whatever day you decide to do this trapping on, try to stick to it if you can. So if you put the trap out on a Tuesday, you know, try to service it on a Tuesday for those following, you know, four weeks. Um, I mean, sometimes rain or something like that will, you know, chase you out of the field, and we understand that. Uh, but it's it's kind of best for everyone to kind of keep it on that weekly schedule. Okay, that's uh, sort of the uh, the monitoring piece that I have. I'm going to turn this back over to Celeste to finish up. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so it's very critical for us to get usable data. We have to make sure that every vial is labeled. So we will be providing stick on labels uh, for you. Uh, we do request that you use either a pencil or a Sharpie, but please do not use ballpoint pen um, because that often gets washed off. So you'll see um, in the middle there is the, what the label will look like and at the bottom is an example. Um, the most important thing is the date collected and the trap location to circle whether it's your, everybody would be on that same date would have an edge trap, an interior trap, so we need to know which is which. Um, it will definitely help to add the county and the farm and the crop, um, but you can abbreviate a bit, you know, because um, you're going to be doing those, th that information will be there every time. Um, so that is about it for the labels. Um, on the next slide, in terms of shipment, we've bought these little shipping box, these very small but sturdy shipping boxes that we will send you. Um, they will have the address label already on there and we're going to include postage. Um, and each one will hold four of these vials. You do, it is important to make sure this, the caps are screwed on tightly. I did receive a shipment last year from one county. <laughs> uh, about half of the vials uh, had spilled out over the package. It was a mess. Um, so these will be sent to me. The reason we're dividing it into the two different batches is because um, 
it is rather timely that the growers like to know if this has showed up yet. So the idea is rather than get, getting them at the end of the four weeks, if we get some halfway through, we'll try and look at them within a day or so after receiving them, and then we will know whether um, they are positive or not for spotted wing. Uh, I think that's it for that. This is just a summary of what we're planning to provide for you. Um, over on the left, you see what you'll need to set up the trap. The first week, you need the two traps, you need the two lures, a bottle of apple cider vinegar. Uh, and again, with that apple cider vinegar, um, you'll actually be using some of it, um, well, you'll be using some of it full strength when you collect the samples and some of it at dilute strength. Um, mini bottle of detergent. What we are not providing is a steak. Because uh, again, we're hoping you have a trellis wire, you'll just hang the trap on the trellis, trellis wire. But you, if you would end up needing a stake, we ask if you can just improvise with something that you have nearby. In terms of the sample collection, that's where you'll need the eight glass vials and a set of labels for those. Uh, we have a special funnel that has a very narrow neck, uh, a fine strainer, a wash bottle, uh, a fine paintbrush, and the two mailing boxes and postage. The wash bottle, uh, we recommend that you put in the full strength apple cider vinegar into that. And that's what you use to just wash when you um, plop the, the, the contents of the strainer down on top of the funnel. You need the wash bottle to then just um, wash that contents down into the little vial that's underneath. Okay, Jen, that's that one. This is just showing you, uh, you might get questions from grow. We're not going to go in today into details about management of this pest, whether by chemicals or non-chemicals, but we realize you might get questions from the growers. So we just want you to be aware. One of the most common questions is what chemicals are available. So this chart is available um, on the back of our two page uh, general information sheet that shows all the different crops, all the different products and just a few critical details about each one. Okay, next slide. And then so finally, um, these are just some other resources, whether it's for you or for you to pass on to the grower. Uh, at the top, we have some basic information on the biology and management is summarized um, in this one document that has that chart on it. Um, there are a few other documents like about um, the salt water test, checking for larvae and a few other things that are all on my website that's um, the pest management website. Uh, then at the bottom, we do remind you, hopefully you've already seen uh, Jim's YouTube instructional videos, um, but of course they're always there if you need to view them again uh, at that URL. Also, we want to mention we have a, a new spotted wing fact sheet is actually on Ohio Line. Um, this was headed up by Elizabeth Long, who's up at our, our Worcester campus. Um, and that has a lot of good information about management. So whether that's for you or the grower, those are available. Okay, well, thank you, Celeste. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, as I mentioned before, we're gonna go through and show you one time this transfer process again, because this is, again, a really critical thing for us to get right. And um, so I'm gonna uh, end the webinar at this point in time here. So in the slideshow part in the slideshow part that's right um okay so i presume you can all see me right now is that right celeste yeah can you see me okay so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna try to slide this back a little bit and show you <clears throat> all the various pieces hopefully this is going to work out um so in your kit you're going to get most likely a quart of apple cider vinegar which is sort of going to be represented by this big jug here this is gonna be diluted to 50%. And so what that means, you're gonna take about half of what's in that uh, initial quart of apple cider vinegar, and you're gonna pour it into the squeeze bottle. And this is gonna to be to help rinse out some of the specimens that are gonna be uh, in, the, in the transfer process hung up in the funnel, okay? So these are gonna be things that are gonna be sort of coming your way. Um, also, in your goodie bag is gonna be a funnel. You're gonna have the trap, which really comes in two parts. It is the bottom part, and it's the top part. And I don't have a lure right here at the office, but I'm representing the lure by this little uh, pink piece of paper here. Now, when the lure comes to you, it'll be 
uh, sealed up in a little um, silver foil package. So all you do is just tear off the top of the foil package. You'll pull out the bag that smells like um, uh, vinegar chips, salt vinegar chips. There's a little uh, little grommet that's in that. Just put the grommet um, kind of right here in the bottom of this hook. Okay, once you get the hook, you'll be able to see it. And then that just kind of gets pushed up into the top of the trap and you'll have it sort of hanging like this, okay? What else you're gonna get is going to be um, a bunch of vials like this that are gonna be the actual end reservoir uh, for the insects that you catch in the trap. And you're gonna get a bunch of labels which are kind of represented by this little pink sticky right here, but again, there'll be information on here that you'll want to uh, pay attention to. Some of the last things you're gonna get <clears throat> are gonna be a strainer. It's going to help you take the insects out of this and help transfer them to the vial. And then you're going to get a little paintbrush to try to get those last few that are either in the strainer or in the bottom of the trap. Okay, so let's go ahead and take this from the top. Now, I have done this for a number of years and I do this at a lot of, of sites every year. So I have kind of um, rigged up my own uh, way to carry all these, all this sample stuff around. But for you, if you have you know, some kind of a tote, a cleaning tote, or even like a cardboard box to put all these things into as you go into the field, that's gonna help you not lose parts and pieces as you walk from place to place. So anything you have, a cardboard box or a little tote like this is gonna help you, okay? All right, so again, as I mentioned before, what we're gonna be doing is giving you all these pieces and then you're gonna to have to do the assembly. So when you go to put the traps out the very first time, you know, what you're going to do is you're going to take this jug that's 50% apple cider vinegar. You'll take the top off. You'll pour in about an inch of solution in the bottom of the trap. And there's like a little um, bubble at the bottom of this trap, which is just about an inch. So just fill up to that little bubble mark, and then you're good. Then you take the top with the lure, and you slide it down inside here, okay? And you tighten it. Jim? Yes. Yeah. One little thing, before you put the lid on, they're gonna add the drop of soap. Well, that's, oh, that's gonna be- You already put here. the drop in there, okay. Oh, it's be in here. Sorry, yeah, so you'll put a drop of soap in here and then you'll be good. Okay, so you tighten this on here, okay. And now when you go out to the field, you know, or you can even do it right in the field, whatever you wanna do, you'll find the bush or the, uh, the trellis line and you'll hang this on there and that's all you do for the first week, okay. Then you come back and a week later, and now there's presumably something that's in the bottom of this trap. And so leave that sort of hang up in the bush for a second. And now we turn our attention to the vial. Um, you might find that it's easier to, you know, write all your information on the label itself and then stick it on the vial or, you know, uh, put this on the vial first and then fill it out whichever way is easiest for you. The bottom line is this label should be filled out first, okay? You take the top off. Put that down either inside your box or on a level piece of ground. Um, then what I do is I'll go ahead over to where the trap is. I'll just screw the bottom off. You don't have to necessarily take it off the bush. You can if you want, that makes it easier, but just take this off. Now all of the bugs that we want are in the bottom here. And then this is the strainer. And we're gonna try to separate the liquid from all the insects that are here. Now the way I, that I normally do this is just kind of give it a little bit of a swirl. Okay, get all those insects kind of moving around suspended and then you take your strainer and if you just simply pour through the strainer and then have the apple cider vinegar pour onto the ground, it'll catch all of the bugs coming from the container into the strainer. Um, apple cider vinegar, excuse me, and a dilute ratio is a little bit of a herbicide. So you don't want to pour this on the plants. You can pour it on a weed that's maybe in the field where you're at or whatever, um, but just be aware this is sort of like a mild herbicide. So now you have um, insects that are, that are in here and potentially some that are in the bottom of the trap that haven't been uh, pulled out yet. So what you can do is take your um, paintbrush and just try to pull those couple out and kind of knock them into the strainer, okay? When that's done, put the trap down. You've got your funnel. Put your funnel inside of I'm not sure if you can see this or not. Maybe it's just a little bit too. Yeah. Okay. So now you've got your labeled vial. You've got the funnel. 
you've got all the insects that are in your little strainer. And now what typically I would do is I would just <clears throat> flip this over and give a little bit of a tap, okay? And that gets about 90% of the insects out of the strainer and into the funnel. Again, you've got your little paintbrush. If there's anything left, just kind of brush those into the funnel, okay? When this is done, you set this down. And now you've got some insects that are in the vial and some that are in the inside of the funnel. This is where the squeeze bottle comes in. Now, what you want to do is you want to be very efficient when you spray this because you only have so much volume in this little vial. So as efficiently as you can, you want to spray around the edge of the funnel and wash all of the insects down and into the vial. Depending upon how many you catch week by week, they might actually get plugged up in the bottom of the funnel nose. What I do sometimes is then take the end of the paintbrush and just kind of push them through and into the vial. Okay, give it a little tap, put that back in there, give it a little bit of squirt and spray everything down into the vial. When that's done, funnel comes out, we get the top, we put it on nice and tight, and then we're ready to move on to our second trap. Uh, almost. <laughs> so this is empty, okay. Now we'll take the apple cider vinegar, we'll fill this back up, to about that one inch line like I mentioned to you before so right about here we've got the lure in the top we put that back on and we hang that back up in the tree or into the bush where it was before and then we move on to our second trap so that's the basic process uh, from start to finish um, all those parts and pieces then can go back into your carrying container and go on to the second site Okay, Celeste, did I miss anything there that you could want to comment on? Um, the only thing is, if you wanted to point out that the, the trap does have the two openings on each side, and to make sure when you're pouring that you have those openings um, on the side and not... Right. Um, so this little area right here, this is where the insects actually come in. So there's one, two, actually three of them, okay? And on the back side, there's kind of an area where there's not. And so when you pour, you want to pay attention to pour in that area where there's no um, black uh, entryway, because otherwise it'll serve as a strainer and your liquid comes out, but your bugs stay inside of the jar. So again, give it kind of a swirl, get everything sort of suspended, and then dump it you know, fairly quickly into the funnel. If you dump it real slow, then things might get hung up and you'll have more to actually clean out of the jar here. Um, but otherwise, I think that was pretty much the process. It should take you you know, a couple of minutes per trap to change out. It really shouldn't take you that long. Um, recharge the trap with a drying solution, put it back on the trellis or back on the plant where it was, and then come back and do it again uh, the week after. Yes, Celeste. One other little note is it could be if there are not a lot of insects or people being super efficient that they might end up, everything's done in the vial, but it's only like halfway filled with the vinegar or a third of the way we would actually like you to fill that vial all the way to the top um, to just make sure that all the insects, it, uh, we're using this basically um, full strength apple cider vinegar acts as a fairly, fairly good short term preservative. So we wanna make sure those insects are preserved um, for the week or two that they're in there. Um, so it helps to, to just fill the vial all the way. Okay. Um, so I think that's all the comments that I had. Celeste, is there any other last minute comments that you might have? I don't think so. I think we need to open it up for questions. And did you notice that Linda did? Yeah, yeah, I, I saw that Linda join us. Good morning, Linda, glad you can make it. Everyone is now officially unmuted. So if there's any questions about, you know, site selection, uh, where in the field we should put the trap, you know, how the trap should be hung, any questions about how the insects are transferred from the trap over to the vial or shipping of the vial back to Columbus, this is your chance. I have a question about uh, setting the traps if I'm working in an ever-bearing uh, strawberry patch. How close to the ground would those be set then? Yeah, so... Um, I think what we found before is if you put them right on the ground, then slugs crawl all over it. So um, in that case, you're gonna have to find like a little um, 
piece of wood or something that's got a little bend to it to stick that in the ground okay. and then hang the trap off of it. It's not a very big trap. It's about the size of a quart peanut butter jar. So it's not very big and there's a metal hook on it. So anything that just kind of gets it, even if it hangs a little bit of an angle, that's fine. It doesn't have to be perfectly level, but anything that gets it a couple inches off the ground would be fine. We just don't want the slugs to kind of overtake it. Good question though. So, but we don't really have uh, anything small to ship you for that. So you just have to get maybe a little bit inventive and find something. If you can't find something, uh, let us know and we'll, um, we'll come up with something for you. And each of those, go ahead, somebody else. No, 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 finish, finish. Um, so each of those four dates, we're checking the traps. We do both traps each time. Correct. Okay. The only other note I thought of that I don't think was mentioned is when you're debating about the exact place you're gonna put the trap is in general, you want it on the shadier side. Like ideally it's not so much above the canopy, but just immediately underneath the canopy. And like if it's more on the north side, we just know that the flies don't like really hot weather. They like it a little cooler. So if it can be just on a, <clears throat> excuse me, a slightly shady part of the plant, that's a bit better. But you know, this is the, the very fine tuning part of the, the whole decision. Yeah, I think, um, you know, one thing that we um, mentioned, but I want to reinforce, I know a couple of you mentioned that the farms you're going to be on are diversified. They've got raspberries, blackberries, strawberries, peaches, you know, how do you decide? Again, just talk with the grower and figure out uh, which one of those flowers and fruits first, and that will be where the spotted wing are attracted primarily. If you have two crops that are sort of competing at the same time, and let's say the choices are strawberries and something else, uh, go with the something else because we don't really see strawberries as being um, a major target at this time of the year for spotted wing. As Celeste said, as we get to those ever bearing that go all through the summer and more into the fall, those are more of a target. But for this time of year, um, other crops beyond strawberries would be uh, probably better to monitor. If, if you only have strawberries, then that's fine. But you know, again, the spotted wing will, will tend to go uh, to maybe the black raspberries, uh, blackberries, uh, and maybe blueberries initially, and then kind of move, move on from there. So Tammy or Linda, do you have any questions about setting these up or your site? You answered all of my questions. This was really well done. Wow, that's amazing. I've never had all that said <laughs> before about my presentation. I guess after 10 years, we're getting it straight, Celeste. <laughs> Linda, do you have any questions about um, you know, putting the traps out or, or transferring any of the contents to any of the vials? No, I don't think so. We're, we're using the, uh, the full strength, the 50% vinegar in the vials. Right. But, right. We're dilu but we're diluting it to put in the traps. Right. So when you do the wash down into the actual vials, so when you go from here to here, this is 100%, okay, right okay. from the jar that Celeste will give you. Okay. When you mix up your drowning solution, what goes in the bottom of the trap? that's where you got this, okay? So it's gonna be basically two cups or six, roughly 16 ounces of apple cider vinegar, just double that volume. So 16 ounces of water gives you a quart of about 50%. And Celeste is gonna do the, uh, the quick math and figure out if that's enough, but I think that should be enough to, um, to fill up eight of these. I'm very confident that one quart uh, is, is going to be able to fill up eight of these. Days. So you'll have a little bit of maybe at the very end, apple cider vinegar left over. This is after week four. If you do, you can just dump it out. You don't have to keep it. Um, likewise, you know, if there's anything left in here, you can dump that out too. If it turns out for whatever reason that you run short on maybe what's in here to kind of rinse down the specimens for whatever reason, you can use some of this right here, okay, it, it's okay. It's a very short term, you know, preservative. By the time we get those, you know, in Columbus and look those over in a week or two, it's not gonna be an issue. So you don't have to go out and buy more, just use what you have. We would prefer the 100%, you know, be used in the vials as we finish, and we would prefer that the 50%, you know, be used as a drowning solution in the bottom of the traps. But, you know, make that work for you, okay? 
Okay, what about the uh, soap? You said uh, a, little, a little bit of soap to break the surface tension in the yeah, drowning that's solution. Gonna, that's going to be in your little uh, goodie bag that I don't have with me. It's just going to be a little tiny bottle. It's only, what, a couple drops, Celeste? Is that all you? I think, all you like, in a single trap setup, you need one drop. But if you're going to mix it up in advance, you know, like um, a whole quart of the stuff that's going to be enough to last all four weeks, you might use like eight drops of it. Okay. okay. So again, it's, it's a very small amount, but yeah, that'll uh, be detailed in uh, the notes that come with all the packaging. It's going to be a little tiny squeeze ball about this big, just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and you're done. And the whole, the whole volume of this right here, add your water, have your apple cider vinegar already there, kind of give it a swirl, and you should be good for the whole season. Yeah, the only thing magic about it is just, it is unscented. It's sort of hard to find completely unscented detergent. Right. Um, and not that we think the scent makes a huge difference, but we did manage to find some unscented. So we're just a little bit of control. Yeah. 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 So, um, I think that's, that's primarily it. You know, uh, I appreciate you volunteering to do this, you know, um, there's going to be one other site or maybe two other sites that do this. And so we're going to put this video up online. And then uh, those folks will be able to um, watch it and hopefully, you know, get the gist of all the, the, the part that we're doing here is, is pretty straightforward. I just want to make sure that you're, you're all comfortable with the process. And if you have any questions at any time, you can give me a call or an email or Celeste a call or an email, and we can uh, hopefully solve that for you right there on the spot. So uh, I guess we're kind of at the end. Does anyone have any last uh, comments about it or are we all thumbs up and ready to go all right Doug's thumbs up ready to go I assume Tammy and Linda are too well thanks for your time this morning appreciate it uh, yep. look, for, look for that package to come in the next uh, couple of weeks I think I do have one question oh sure uh, it looked like it's the uh, the insect spread from the west coast to Ohio pretty quickly how did it spread Celeste what do you think shipments of fruit yeah to yeah. uh, farm markets. It was amazing how fast it spread. Yeah, it, it doesn't fly that far, but yeah, it, like a lot of pests, it's a, it's a good hitchhiker, so it kind of moved around the country that way. And, and you know, Pacific Northwest grows a lot of, of berry crops, and I guess they ship them all over the country. So. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, good, good question, Doug. But yeah, it, it spread through distribution, just like kind of the Emerald Ash Borer story, same, same thing. Another, another one of our Oriental invaders? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's from it's from Asia, from uh, the eastern side of China, exactly. So yeah, um, you know, with commerce as it is, we yeah. can expect these things in the future. But uh, um, and so I guess the last thing I'll say is is if we do find something positive, we'll get back to you as soon as we can, and you should you know tell the grower that we have positively identified it, and that might kick off them af asking us more questions about management of that pest so you know if it comes to that you know if we know we'll let you know and you can let the grower know and whatever the uh anr educator uh -huh. is you might want to tell them as well okay actually jim that maybe brings up one other sort of concluding thought is at this point we're sort of, if we had to make a wild guess we are sort of expecting that this fly probably is on most farms in ohio but what we're really trying to emphasize is the time of first detection um, because, you know, on any given fa farm, if they've had it one year, they sort of expect to have, have it every year after that. But there is some uncertainty about exactly when it shows up. Mm -hmm. So that's why we are um, suggesting to do this for only the short period. All, other years, we've done this like for the entire long season. Um, but we're trying to emphasize this mid-June to mid-July because we know that's when the majority of farms get the first detection. Right. So, I mean, when you find it, it could be early in that period. It might not be till the end of that period. You know, we're not sure. Um, but we're just trying to, because it's so much work to go through these samples, we're just trying to emphasize that first detection. And then once they have that first detection, they're probably going to be on a spray program and they don't really need to keep sampling over and over again once they get first detection. So that's our, right. our general approach this year. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, and that's a, that's a great summary. So I think with that, we're all wrapped up here. Again, uh, expect those packages in a couple of weeks. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to either Celeste or myself. And thank you for your time, and appreciate your help with this project. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. Bye-bye.